Hello everyone, welcome to Chandler Science, AP Physics 1, Energy Unit Exam. In this uh, video, we're going to go over the every question from the uh, multiple choice portion of the exam, so you guys can do your corrections. If you're from somewhere else on the internet, cool. Um, this is the questions that we had in our class, and hope you learned something. Well, let's dive right in and get, and get busy. So number one, we're traveling in an elliptical orbit on the sun. Mars gains speed during, this, during the part of the orbit where it is getting closer to the sun. Which of the following can be uh, used to explain this gain in speed? All right, guys, so the answer is going to be A. Um, why A? All right, well, as Mars gets closer to the sun, the Mars-Sun system loses potential energy and gains kinetic energy. That's key. Or just like when an object on the Earth is really high up above the surface, right, as it falls towards the surface, it's losing height, and therefore it's losing gravitational potential, but it's going to gain kinetic energy. This is true for Mars and the sun. If we consider sun to be the center, like the surface of the sun is, you know, the place where we're measuring uh, like the, the zero point for gravitational potential energy, then um, the further away we go, the, the, the more potential energy we have. And as we get closer to the sun, we lose potential energy, but we gain kinetic, just like you do when you fall towards the Earth. Um, B doesn't make a lot of sense. A component of the gravitational force exerted on Mars is perpendicular to the direction of motion, causing an acceleration and hence a gain in speed along that direction. No, the, direct, the acceleration here is causing a change in direction, not a gain in speed necessarily. Um, so that's not a great answer. Uh, C, the torque exerted by Mars. We haven't talked about torque yet. There's no torque here. It's gravitational. Uh, centripetal motion, not rotation. And then D, the centripetal force exerted on Mars is greater than the gravitational force during this segment of the orbit, causing Mars to gain speed as it gets closer to the sun. So some students did pick D. And the reason why it's not D is because remember that centripetal just means direction. So when an object is undergoing circular motion, the centripetal force is caused by a different force, right? We have we have tension forces, gravity, um, friction, you know, uh, applied forces, normal forces. But centripetal force is not a type of force. It just means a direction. So the centripetal force in this case is caused by the gravitational force. The gravitational force on Mars by the sun is towards the center of the circle. So the centripetal force here is the gravitational force. So it can't be larger than itself. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so D does not our answer. So again, answer is A. Uh, we're losing potential, so we're going to gain kinetic. All right, let's go to two, three identical blocks. Each take a different path from the height H to the ground. Block A is released from rest and falls vertically. Block B is released from rest and slides down a frictionless incline. And block C is projected horizontally with an initial speed V. The question on this, uh, this number two was, what block lands with the greatest speed? Um, the answer is going to be block C because it has an initial velocity v. They're all going to gain the same amount of speed as they fall, but since c began with a non-zero velocity, it had some velocity v greater than zero, um, when it gains the same amount that a and b gains, it's going to have more at the end because it started with something, right? It's like a and b are both starting with zero, but let's say c starts with five, and if they all gain 10, well, a and b will have 10, but c is going to have 15 because it started with, with five instead of zero, right? So. It starts with, uh, with a velocity, so it's going to have more at the end. Uh, but again, I will say that they all do gain the same amount because they're all converting the same potential energy into kinetic energy. All right, so that's number two. Let's go to three. What is the ratio of the kinetic energy of an object of mass 3m moving at a speed 2v to an object of mass m over 2 moving at speed v. So this is a rule of one problem, right? Where we, we make everything a one and then we kind of compare how it changed and we're looking for the ratio of change here. So um, kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared and we're going to make everything a one. Uh, so m is a one and v is a one. We're squaring that. And so for the first object, let's go over here and do this one. So it's k equals 1 half uh, times one. But this is this one is for m. This one here is for m, so it's being 3m. So we're gonna, instead of being a 1, we're going to make it a 3. It's 3 times bigger than it was. And then times uh, 2v, so the velocity is being doubled, right? Whatever it was is being doubled, so we're going to double it here to 2. Don't forget to square it. We're going to solve this out and see what we get. 1 half times 3 times 2 squared. So that's 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12, half that is 6, so we get 6 there. And the other object is when we get a mass 2m at a speed v. So do the same thing, rule of 1, 1 half. It's m is m over 2, or half of 1, which is a half, times speed v. So just v, right? We're not changing it. Not greater, not less, just v. So we'll leave it a 1. Square that. k here is equal to 1 squared is 1 times a half is a half. 
times half again is a quarter. So it's 0.25. Excuse me. So it's a ratio. So I'm going to do 6 divided by a quarter. Uh, and we get 24, which is the correct answer. E. All right. Hope that makes sense. Remember, guys, at any point there are questions on this, you can always shoot me a message on Remind, ask me in class, after school, or an email, or however else you want to get a hold of me. All right, let's keep going to number four. Um, we have a rough section of track here. A block of mass three kilograms slides along a horizontal surface that has negligible friction except for one section, as shown above in the picture. The block arrives at the rough section with a speed of five meters per second and leaves a half a second later with a speed of three meters a second. What is the magnitude of the average frictional force exerted on the block by the rough section of the surface? All right, so we're looking for the force done here by the friction, right? By friction. Now, friction, there's several ways to find friction, right? We have uh, friction force equals mu times the normal force. Well, we don't know what mu actually is, so it's not really going to help us too much here. Um, we know normal force. Normal force is going to be 30 newtons, but we don't know mu. Um, other ways to find for, uh, force here. Well, work is the force of friction. Since the force of friction is what's slowing the block down, it's doing the work times displacement. So maybe we could find what displacement was here. It's an option. What else can we do here? We also know that um, work is changing kinetic energy. The network, I should say, changing K. Uh, we can calculate the change in kinetic energy. We could calculate, we could also calculate the uh, acceleration of this block. Um, so lots of things we could do here. I'm going to do it the way that first came to my mind, which was to find the acceleration of the block. So acceleration is change in velocity over time. We're slowing down here. So acceleration is, our velocity is going from 5 to 3. So it's a change of negative 2, which is slowing down over half a second. So over, over time here is 2, the delta t. So that's going to be a negative 4 acceleration. So our acceleration is negative 4. Um, force is mass times acceleration, just Newton's second law, right? Um, and since the only force on the block that's causing an acceleration here is the force of friction, I'm going to plug in force of, or a mass rather, of 3, and acceleration of 4. It looks like it just wants the magnitude, so we don't care about direction, so it's going to plug in a 4 for acceleration. That's going to be my force of friction here. And that's going to be a force of friction of 12 Newtons, or B. The right answer. Okay, so 12 newtons there. Um, a lot of other ways we could have done this, but I think that's probably the quickest, easiest way to do it. You, again, you could have also found how far the object moves and used the work equation. Uh, lots of other options here, but that's the easiest way I think to do it. All right, let's go to number five then. Chugging along. According to the same scenario as in question four, what is the magnitude of the work done? by the frictional force exerted on the block by the rough section of the surface. So now we want to find the work done. Well, hopefully you were able to find the uh, friction force here, because if we do find friction force, it makes our, li it makes our life a lot easier. Um, so the work here, again, delta K is going to be the net work done. We can also think about the, how far we go, force times displacement. We already have, we have the um, force already. So if we wanted to calculate the displacement, we could use kinematics and we could say, okay, well, delta X equal to one half uh, AT squared plus V naught T and find out the displacement. But I think the easiest thing to do here is just do the network equals the change of kinetic energy, right? So what was my final kinetic energy and what is my initial kinetic energy? And again, it wants the magnitude, so we don't really care about whether it's positive work or negative, it just wants the amount, whether or not it's positive or negative. So it doesn't really matter if, which way we do it here. So uh, I'm gonna do my initial, or sorry, my final minus initial. Final kinetic energy is one half. The mass of the block was three kilograms times my initial velocity, which was, oops, sorry, which was, I think it was five, right? I'm just gonna go, uh, yeah, it was five squared minus my uh, initial kinetic energy. Am I doing it backwards? Oh, sorry, yes, I am. Final minus, it's just a three, sorry, guys. My final velocity was three, sorry about that. Final velocity is three. All right, minus my initial kinetic energy is one half, mass of three again, times five, so I'm gonna do five squared there. So final kinetic energy minus my initial kinetic energy. That's gonna be my net work done. Um, since, and again, since friction is the only force doing work here, 
this is going to work. There are other forces at play. There is gravity pulling the block down and normal force pushing up. Remember, those forces don't do any work here because they are perpendicular to the displacement and also they're canceling each other out, so they're not doing any work. All right, so we have here. 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27. And, of course, my calculator is nowhere to be found. I know where it is, but I'll grab it in a second. I'll use my phone calculator because it's... It'll serve here. So we got uh, 3 squared is 9 times 20 times 3. 27 divided by 2. That's 13 and a half. Minus 5 squared is 25 times 3 divided by 2 is 37 and a half. And we subtract those two, and it looks like we're going to get. I'm very bad at math, so I'm double checking 24 joules, which is the correct answer. And that is going to be A. All right. So there you go. Again, you could have also found kinematics, find out just, uh, delta x here, plug that in for the displacement, and use the force of 12 newtons here, and uh, plug that in. You would have got the same answer. Um, but uh, either way, there you go. All righty then. Cool. Let's go to number six. <clears throat> All right, number six. Uh, we have an object of mass m attached to a spring on a frictionless inclined plane that makes it an angle theta with the horizontal shown above. The object is released from rest with the spring in its unstretched position. As the object moves on the plane, its displacement from the unstretched position is x. What is the magnitude of the work done by gravity as the object slides down the incline? Well, uh, the work done by gravity, work here is force of gravity times displacement cosine the angle. Um, so we're going to, um, it's, we gotta be careful here though, because this is the typical equation for work, but uh, let's be careful because uh, the displacement is down this way, right? So the work, now the force of gravity here is the component down the ramp, right? And the displacement is down the ramp this way. So I'm actually gonna, I actually don't need cosine here right now. Just hang in there with me. Um, because, let's drop everybody diagram for this. So here's the block. All right, and we have gravity down. Now, gravity has components. Um, is the block moving down the ramp or up the ramp? What are we having here? Object of mass m, it's spring from incline that makes an angle theta with the horizontal shown above. The object is released from rest with the spring, from rest with the spring in its unstretched position. Object moves down. Okay, so it's gonna move down the plane. All right, so we have down the ramp into the ramp. Now, this component here is the only one doing work because this component here is perpendicular to the to the displacement, so it cannot do work. So we don't care about this vector at all, right, that component. We only care about the one down the ramp, the one I have circled. So what is that one? Well, uh, this is our angle here. This is theta, so that's going to be opposite, so it's going to be sine. So it's sine theta. So uh, how far does it move? It moves the distance x. So it turns out that this component this is mg sine theta, and since it's already in the same direction, this vector component here is already in the same direction as displacement. We don't need to add the cosine onto the end. That's what they're trying to get you to think about in C. The answer is A. They're trying to get you in C to think, oh, wait, i got to add on the cosine because I remember the, the formula for work was it, uh, F times D times cosine theta. But that's only if the force vector is different uh, in different direction than the displacement vector. But in this case, the displacement vector and force vector, this component of the force vector is in the same direction as displacement. So it's just mg sine theta times x. x is the displacement, how far the block is moving right here. So that's like, that's the d, right? We're putting x in instead of the d because that's what they're calling it. So it's going to be mg sine theta times x or mgx sine theta, same difference, right? All right, that's number six. Let's go to number seven. All right, a uh, two kilogram block is placed at the top of an incline and released from rest near Earth's surface an unknown distance of h above the ground. All right, the angle theta between the ground and the incline is also unknown. Frictional forces between the block and the incline are considered to be negligible, so we're not worried about friction. The block eventually slides to the bottom of the incline at their 0.75 seconds. The block, the block's velocity v, as a function of time t, is shown in the graph starting from the instant it is released. How could a student use the graph to determine the total energy of the block earth 
system. So again, there are a couple ways to do it here, but let's go through and see what the right answer is. Um, a says use mg y theta with m equals two and y theta equal to the area bound between the horizontal axis and the curve. Hmm, interesting. Um, the area bound between the curve and the axis, talking about this area in here, is a displacement, but it's not the height, right? That's a displacement down this direction. That is not going to be the height. If it was the height, I'd say cool, but it's not the height, so it's not going to work. So it's not going to be A. The answer is, of course, B, as many of you already know. B says, use one half mv squared with m equals 2 kilograms and vf equals to the final velocity of the object that can be found from the graph, which is, looks like one and a half uh, meters per second. So if we put that in, that will give us the total energy of the block system. At the bottom of the ramp, we, whatever connect, whatever potential energy we had is now gone because we're now at the bottom of the ramp. We have no height anymore. And it's all been put into uh, kinetic energy. So whatever kinetic energy at the bottom of the ramp is, that must be the total energy of the system. So that's the best answer. Answer is B. All right. The bottom of the ramp, all the energy is in kinetic anyway. So we find the velocity. We have the mass at the bottom of the ramp. We're good to go. All righty then. Number eight. Ah, one of the most missed questions from the exam. All right, so a person holds, we got a four kilogram block at position A uh, in contact with an uncompressed vertical spring with a spring constant of 500 newtons per meter. The person gently lowers the block from rest at position A to rest at position B, which of the following describes a change in the energy of the block spring earth system as a result of the block being lowered. All right, so this is about the change in energy of the system. And we have three kinds of energy at play here. We have a kinetic energy, so the energy, the change in energy of the system is equal to the change in energy of all the different types of energy, right? So we have kinetic energy. We're going to add that up with our spring potential energy. And we're going to add that up with our change in gravitational potential energy. If all these changes add up to, say, zero, for example, then we won't have any change in energy. If all these changes add up to something else or, or a negative number, that means we'll gain or lose energy accordingly, right? But this is going to show us, this will be a delta here. Let me fix that triangle okay uh, all right so what kind of energy do we have well, do we have any change in kinetic energy well no it says we start from rest and it ends at rest so there is no change in k however there is going to be a change in the spring energy of the system because it's spring energy starts uncompressed at position a but by the time we're at position b we have squished the spring right we've compressed it so our change in spring energy started from zero how much do we we gain something right we gain some spring energy spring energy is one half little k x squared, potential spring energy one half, or k was 500, x, now here's the tricky part, make sure you got your units in place, these are in centimeters, we must be in meters, now from 30 centimeters, it compressed the spring down to here, so the change here is 0.1 meter, or 10 centimeters, or 0.1 meters, that's going to be complicated to square that, so we're going to do this all in here, we're going to punch it in, and I'll get my calculator on my phone, because it's all like that right now, so 0.1 squared is 0.01 times 500 is 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. Two so we gained, excuse me, 2.5 joules of spring potential energy. What about UG? Didn't we lose some UG because the position of the block got closer to the ground? So the block lost potential energy, gravitational potential energy. So let's see how much we lost there. Well, um, this is going to be our, our change in potential energy is equal to mg delta y, right? Our change in our height, how much we lost. Ug is equal to the mass, which was 4 kilograms. G is 10. And our change in y, we went from 3 centimeter, or 30 centimeters to 20 centimeters. So we lost final minus position initials at 0.2 minus 0.3. All right, so that's going to be Ug equals 4 times 10 is 40 times a negative 0.1, 40, I wrote 4, there we go, and then uh, we multiply that together, so our change in potential gravitational energy is negative 0.4, we actually, sorry, not 0.4, just 4, my bad, ah, do it, okay, negative 4, there we go, all right, so we gained 2 half joules of spring energy, but we lost 4 joules of gravitational potential, so add it all up, negative 4 plus 2.5, that's a, a loss or a decrease of 1.5 joules of energy. So this system lost negative, or it lost one and a half joules of energy. All right.
Cool. All right, number nine. Let me erase some of this so it's not in the same picture here. Get rid of all this stuff. Go oh, away. I don't like you anymore. Okay. Number nine. Blocks X and Y are connected by a string that passes over a pulley as shown in the, in the figure. Block Y has more mass than block X. Okay, the string and pulley have negligible mass and the pulley rotates with negligible friction. All right, so no friction to worry about, nothing like that. All right, after the, after the blocks are released from rest, what happens to the mechanical energy of e, e mech, mechanical energy of the system consisting of the two blocks and the earth? All right, well, um, block Y is gonna go down here and block X is gonna move up a little bit since block Y has more mass. So we're going to lose a little bit of gravitational potential because while we still, we, we, because Y is bigger, right? So Y is closer to the ground now and X went up. So they kind of switch positions, let's imagine, right? But since Y has more mass, uh, the, the potential energy we lose from Y doesn't quite equal the amount of potential energy we gain from X going up. So X gains height, but Y loses height. And since Y has more mass, we're gonna lose more gravitational potential than we gain. However, we are going to accelerate in this system because block Y is you know, accelerating towards the ground and block X is going up. So we're both gonna gain velocity. Um, so we're not going to decrease, we're not gonna increase. It's gonna be V, we're gonna remain constant. There is no friction here. It's the, the system is the two blocks and the Earth, so we do consider gravitational potential. There's no outside agent doing work on us. Right, so um, that means that the total uh, energy of the system must remain constant. Um, energy is conserved. There's no other energies at play here, so the answer must be B, energy is conserved. All right, so no change in energy, all right? All right, let's go to number 10. Similar type question, uh, similar type picture. This is, uh, again, two masses on a pulley called an Atwood machine connected by a string of negligible mass going over a pulley of negligible, negligible mass and friction. The two blocks are released from rest. M2 is greater than M1. Assume that the re uh, reference line of zero gravitational potential energy is the floor. Which of the following best represents the total gravitational potential energy U and total kinetic energy K of the block block Earth system, so both blocks, as a function of the height H of block M1. So the, I mentioned this in class, but I'll go over it again. So the center of gravity for this system right now is like, say it's, I don't know exactly where it is, but let's say it's like right about here. And the center of mass is essentially, you can think of it as a, a point in space that has, it's kind of like in the average position of all the mass, right? It's like, it, there's, it's a spot where um, it has equal amounts of mass of whatever system it's in around it, right? So it's got equal mass above it, equal mass below it, equal mass to its left, equal mass to its right, all, all every direction, equal mass around it, right? So since M2 has more mass than M1, the center of mass is gonna be more towards M2 than it is towards M1, right? Because it's, it's gonna get closer to M2 because it has more mass, right? So the, the center of mass is more is closer to M2 than it is M1. Now that's before, and what about after? Okay, well after, these, now M2 is down here on the ground, right? Because M2 is gonna fall towards the ground and M1 is gonna go up in the air because they're connected by a string. Now the center of mass, again, it's more closer to M2, so now it's down here somewhere, right? Closer to M2 than it is M1. Well, look at the difference here. It was here, now it's down here. So it, went, it did go down, but it didn't go down to zero. We don't have zero gravitational potential energy because M1 still has some height, right? And M1's part of the system. It's block, block, both blocks and the Earth. So we can't go down to zero gravitational potential. So both graphs that have our, our U going to zero cannot be correct right because we still have some gravitational potential energy so we look at c and b as our as our potential answers here let's look at c first can the answer be c we you know we don't know how much kinetic energy are we gaining how much u are we losing it's hard to say since we don't know what the masses are or, or what the difference difference in masses are anything like that is it, is it accelerating a lot is it accelerating very, a little bit we don't know so let's look at this now we know there's no outside force here no one's pulling on the pulley there's no friction so that means that energy must be conserved is energy conserved in C? Well, K starts off at zero, and U starts off, and initially, let's count the blocks. One, two, three, four, five. It's got five units of energy, whatever the scale is, right? Now, at the end, at, at this position here, U, we have one unit of energy for, for potential, and kinetic has one, two, three. 
Well, this is equals four, right? We had five to begin with, and now only four. So was energy conserved? Nope. So it can't be the right answer. The answer must be B. And B, it is conserved. We lost one joule or one unit of U, but we gained one unit of K. So energy is conserved. It makes sense that we lost a little bit of potential since our center of mass goes down. Um, but it also makes sense we gain some kinetic energy because we should be accelerating in the system. So there you go. The answer is B. Very good. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break and get my calculator and get a drink of water and I'll BRB, but you won't know it, so why am I talking? I don't know, okay, bye. All right, we're back with number 11, a two kilogram block starting from rest, slides 20 meters down in a frictionless inclined plane from X equals Y, or sorry, from X to Y, dropping a vertical distance 10 meters as shown above. The speed of the block at point Y is most nearly what? This is a pretty straightforward conservation of energy problem. Um, initially, I'm at rest. And I have a height 20 meters, and I do I have the yeah, I do have the mass of the block. So initially, I have gravitational potential energy, and at the bottom of the ramp, all of that gravitational potential energy is going to con uh, transform into kinetic energy, and I'll have zero gravitational potential energy, and it all transforms into kinetic. So I have initially, I got gravitational potential, gravitational potential. At the end, final, I'm going to have kinetic. So my final kinetic energy must equal. The uh, gravitational potential I had in the beginning. And once I know that, what that is, I can find my velocity. So let's find out what that is. Um, so mg delta y equals my k. Uh, well, my mass was 2. g is 10. y is also 10. So it looks like my uh, kinetic energy here is going to be 200 equals kf. Right? Oh, very good. Okay. So then I'm going to go ahead and say. Well, since 200, oops, since 200 is my kinetic energy at the bottom of the ramp, then 200 must equal one half mv squared. Again, m is uh, what was it? Two. And I'm going to solve for v here. A half times two is one, so it's just 200 equals v squared. I square both sides, and v is going to equal number 11. Uh, 14 point something, but 14 is the best answer. It's like 14.4 or whatever it is. Uh, so there you go, 14-ish. All right, conservation of energy. All right, let's do it. Number 12, a constant force of 900 newtons pushes a 100 kilogram mass up the inclined plane as shown above at a uniform speed of four meters a second. The power developed by the 900 newton force is mostly what? All right, well power, two ways to find power, work, over time, or power is all equal to force times velocity. That's the one that's not on your formula chart, but you got to remember it because it's going to pop up every now and then. Well, we got 900 newton force going at 4 meters a second. 900 times 4 is 3,600 watts of power. All right, pretty straightforward. 900 times 4, force times velocity. All right, number 13, going so fast. A ball is suspended by a lightweight string, as shown in the figure above. The ball is displaced to position 1 and released. The four labeled positions are evenly spaced along the arc of the ball's motion. Between which adjacent pairs of positions is the change in kinetic energy of the ball the greatest? A lot of you guys said the answer was D. It is not D. The answer is A. How can it be A? How is that possible, you think? Well. Remember, guys, it doesn't matter how far we go horizontally, right? We're, this is a simple energy conservation. We have whatever gravitational potential we have at position one, we're going to lose some to position two, right? Because we're falling. We're falling a distance this far. All right, fall. This is our delta y here. From two to three, we fall a distance this far. That's our delta y. And then from three to four, we fall a distance that far. We don't care how far we go this way. That's not going to convert any energy for us, right? So whatever gravitational potential we have here, whatever we lose, we gain that as kinetic energy, right? We, we say we lose 10 joules of potential, then we gain 10 joules of kinetic, right? Uh, well, so who has the largest drop from one to two? Well, uh, well, answer is one to two. Who has the lar largest drop of height, right? Delta Y. It's not. It's not. We don't care about the. You know, if you if I asked you, you know, is the is this distance this curved distance what we call um. Oh, we call it the uh, arc line or something like that. I forget now. Uh, but this curve distance the same in each one? Yeah, it is the same. But we don't care about that. We care about how far we're falling. And 
the greatest vertical change in height is between position one and two. And so since it has the greatest fall, the greatest change in y is going to be the greatest gain of kinetic energy. That's our answer. All right. Okay, number 14. We got a spring. A block on a level surface is attached to one end of a spring, as shown in the figure above. The other end of the spring is attached to a wall. There is friction between the block and the surface. A person displaces the block from its equilibrium position and releases it. Which of the following shows the mechanical energy E as a function of time t for the system that includes only the block and the system that includes the block and spring? All right, so let's, guys, as the spring gains energy, the block must lose it because the kinetic energy of the block is going into the spring to compress it and to stretch it. And whenever the spring is going towards equilibrium position, it's pushing the block and it's gaining speed. Right? So the block and spring system right, should remain constant because whenever the spring is gaining energy, the block is losing it because it's slowing down. But whenever the block is gaining energy, gaining speed, then the spring is losing energy because it's the one pushing its energy is the one pushing the block to begin with. Right, So it's losing energy. So the spring and block system, energy remains constant except that there's friction. So friction is stealing energy from the system, right? It's, everything, everything's going to slow down and eventually come to a rest. But it can't be A and it can't be D, uh, can't be, can't be B, since B shows that the energy is constant. But isn't friction stealing energy from our spring and our block, taking it away, turning it into dissipated energy? So it can't be constant like this. Is, this, is, this is wrong. It also can't be going up and down. At what point is the, you're telling me that the energy of the block and, and spring go to zero and then magically pop back up? That can't be, right? As the spring gains it, the block loses it. As the block loses it, the spring gains it and vice versa. Right? I think I might have said the same thing there, but you get the idea. It's going back and forth like a seesaw, right? But the total, remember the, the skate park lab, the total is remaining constant. And it would be a flat line, but there's friction involved. So that's why the answer is D. Right? Our block and spring energy does slowly decrease over time at a, at a steady rate like that because friction is stealing the energy. But it's not going up and down like this because, it, again, it, it's, it's, it's just transferring back and forth between the spring and the, and the block as friction kind of, kind of you know, uh, saps the energy out of the whole system. Now, the kinetic energy of just the block, though, is going up and down because what's happening to the block? Think about it. It's going one way, slowing down, stopping, and then it's going to speed up, right? And then gain kinetic energy, and then it's going to slow down. And it's going to turn around and speed up and then slow down and then speed up and slow down and then speed up and then slow down and back and forth until it eventually comes to a rest after friction takes all the energy away, right? But on the ends, when it's it's going fast, it's, it's pushing it and then slowing down and then pushing it and slowing it down back and forth. It's doing that kind of that up and down motion that you see in that graph, right? So D is the best answer. None of the other ones really make any sense. Uh, so there you go. All righty. Let's go on to number 15. All right, classic problem here. A uh, block of mass 10 kilograms moves from position A to position B, as shown in the figure above. The speed of the block is 10 meters a second at A and 4 meters a second at B. The work done by friction on the block as it moves from A to B is most nearly what? All right, guys. So um, we are losing some velocity here, but we are gaining some uh height so what we need to do is say okay what was the energy initially and what is my energy uh not equally and what is my energy at the end all right energy final all right they got to equal each other minus the work being done well who's doing the work well friction is doing the work right that's the work done by friction if there was no friction then the energy initially would equal the energy at the end, right? Makes sense. But there is friction at play here. So what kind of energy do we have? Well, in the beginning, we only have kinetic, right? Because at position A, we have no height. So we have kinetic energy initially. Friction is going to do some amount of work here from friction. Remember, we put the work on the same side of the conservation of energy equation as the initial energy. And that's going to equal our final energy. What kind of energy do we have at the end? Well, we have kinetic. And we have gravitational potential because we gained height, but we still have some speed. We didn't lose all of our speed, right? And then we're going to solve this equation and we're going to get the amount of work done, right? So our initial kinetic energy, we have a 10 kilogram, 10 mass and initial velocity of 10. So 1 half times 10, that's the mass, times velocity squared, whoops, 10 squared here, 1 half mv squared, right? Minus work 
equals one half. The mass is still 10. Now our velocity at the end is only four, square that two, plus the energy we gained from our height. So it's uh, 10 times 10. We gained a height of two meters. So we went up two meters. We don't care how far we went this way, right? It doesn't matter. All right, let's solve all this stuff here. Got my calculator now, yay. Okay. So I'm gonna kind of move, I'm, you know, I should have written this better, but I'm gonna kind of come up, up here now. So 10 squared is 100 times 10 is 1,000 uh, uh, times a half is 500. So we've got 500 minus the work we do from friction equals, uh, you know, I don't leave myself enough room here, am I? Let's go up here. All right, 500 minus the work equals, all right, how much kinetic energy do we have at the end? Well, 4 squared is 16 times 10 is 140 divided by 2 is 80, so 80 here. Plus my, um, plus my, uh, what do I got here? I got height. So I got 10 times 10 times 2. That is 200. So 200, 200 is there. So I'm then going to uh, subtract, or add these two up. So I got 500 minus work equals 280, right? And then I'm going to basically kind of just solve for W, right? I got a minus 280 both sides. Oops, get ahead of myself. Minus 280 both sides, minus 280 here. And I'm going to plus W to both sides, right? Let's just get see what the work is. Uh, all right, so I do that. And then it looks like work equal to, it should be negative though, shouldn't it? Oh, yeah, because energy is being stolen from our system. So let's do it this way. Let's just say, uh, let's, oh, I'm a derp. Minus 500 both sides. Minus 500 this side. Work equals 280 minus 100 is a negative 220. So we got negative 220 answer is B. And that's the right answer, okay? So friction is taking 220 joules of energy out of the system, all right? Out of the system. Okay. All right, I hope that makes sense. Uh, cool, let's go to number 16. All right. Oh, force displacement graph. All right, I see a graph. Immediately, the first thing I do is think, what kind of graph is it? What does this graph tell me? So before I even read the problem, I'm thinking to myself, all right, force displacement graph tells me area under the curve is work. Area under the curve equals work, all right? Whatever that force is, the work done by that force. An object is moving in the positive x direction while the net force directed along the x axis, oh, this is the net force, so it's a network. While the net force directed along the x-axis is exerted on the object, if the figure above shows the force as a function of position. What is the net work done on the object over the distance shown? All right. Well, let's see. Um, well, I can just kind of tell right away by looking at it. This tri the area of the curve is here, and then here. Doesn't this triangle cancel this triangle? This is a this here is positive. This one here is positive work. This one here is negative work. Then it's below the x-axis. It's negative force. So won't they just cancel each other out? Yeah. And the only one's left is for is this area here. Right? So really, this only area is doing work. Any work is here. This is f f naught and times d. The answer is a f naught times a distance d. Uh, whatever that is, that'll be our work. Right. Okay. Cool. Moving on. Go to 17. A student is asked to move a box from ground level to the top of a loading dock platform as shown in the figures above. In figure one, the student pushes the box up an incline with negligible friction. In figure two, the student lifts the box straight up from the ground level to the loading dock platform. In which case does the student do more work on the box and why? All right, well, the answer um, is neither method. All right, it's the same work. So the, the energy change is the same in either case. If the box starts from rest and ends at rest, there's no change in kinetic energy. However, it does gain gravitational potential because it's the same, same height being gained. Now, some of you might be wondering, but doesn't this doesn't figure one block like move a further distance? So doesn't that like make it make make the work that she's doing more? No, because something is helping her do the work. The normal force is actually lifting up the block a little bit and helping her do some work. So she doesn't have to push as hard. She doesn't have to push as hard uh, up the ramp this way because she's pushing it at an angle. And the normal force is actually helping her a little bit along the way. In figure two, she's fighting gravity the whole time, right? She's fighting gravity 
fight, fighting it straight against gravity, right? The full brunt of the gravitational force is fighting here. But in figure one, let's draw better. Let's make this figure diagram a little better. In figure one, there, this is the figure gravity diagram of the box that she's pushing. We have gravity down, mg. We had normal force this way, though, don't we? Does this normal force kind of help kind of lift the box up a little bit? So I'm pushing the, I'm pushing the box this way, right? So we have gravity down the ramp, gravity into the ramp, right? So I'm only fighting this much force of gravity, whereas in figure two, I'm fighting the whole combined vector. I'm fighting all the force of gravity, right? In, uh, in the, um, the, the, this frictional force cancels out this, this, this force here. So in figure one, I'm only kind of fighting against uh, this component of the gravitational force, right? The one down the ramp. But it won't be as large as the full vector down the ramp. Or sorry, straight down, okay? Hope that makes sense. All right, then, let's go to number 18. Oh, right again, no, <clears throat> I see another force displacement graph. All right away, I tell myself area under curve equals work. Before I even start, a card is moving on a level track in the positive x direction. A force acting parallel to the x-axis is exerted on the cart. The graph above shows the net force exerted on the cart as a function of displacement. As the cart travels from x equals 0 to x equals 4 meters, what is the net change in the kinetic energy of the cart? Well, change in the kinetic energy of the cart is the same thing as work being done. So if I find the work being done area under the curve, I will know the change in energy of the, of the cart. So this, I have this big box here. Area under this curve is uh, uh, it's a it's a square. So just you know, each a, a rectangle, I should say. Every square is a rectangle, right? So the base is two. The height is ten. So it's twenty. Um, this area here is negative work because it's below the x-axis. So it's again a uh, one side is two. Other side is negative five. So it's gonna be negative ten. Combine the two areas in the curve. We got twenty, a positive twenty, and a negative ten. That adds up to a positive ten. So it's an increase of ten joules because once we add up all the area under the, under the curve, the total area is positive ten joules, which means I must have gained positive ten joules of kinetic energy. So that's the work that's been done. All right. Cool. Let's go to number 19. <clears throat> all right, number 19. Um, uh, a two half gram, two and a half gram. This is the only other problem I think I gave you where the units were weird, right? So, uh, as a thousand grams in a kilogram, our units must be in kilograms. So, before I even start, I'm just going to convert this guy to kilograms. So, you have grams, a thousand grams, and one kilogram. So, grams cancel. Oops, grams cancel now. And I'm going to get uh, divided by a thousand. So it's 0.0, 0 0.025 kilograms. Yep. All right. So that's my mass. All right. So a 0 0.0025 kilogram marshmallow is placed on in one end of a 40 centimeter pipe. So that's going to be 0.4 meters. Why can't I write? Can I just have good handwriting for like one day? That'd be so cool. Even my, look where my decimal is. My decimal is like midway up to four. Like, what am I doing? Good Lord. 0.4 meters. That's a little better, I guess. All right. Uh, okay. A person blows into the left end of the pipe to eject the marshmallow from the right end. The average net force exerted on the marshmallow while, the, while it is in the pipe is 0.7 newtons. The speed of the marshmallow as it leaves the pipe is most nearly what? All right. Well, uh, the net work, sorry. Work done equals delta K. My initial kinetic energy is zero. So won't the work being done on, on by the person blowing it equal to my final kinetic energy? Since my initial kinetic energy is zero anyway. Yes, it will. What is work? Work is force times displacement. That will equal one half mv squared. I know the mass of the marshmallow. I know the displacement of the of the force and the force equal 0.7. So I'm going to plug myself in. I got 0.7 times my displacement, which was 40 centimeters or 0.4 meters, gotta be in the right units. That must equal 1 half m, which is 0 0.0025 v squared. I'm gonna solve for v. So 0 0.7 times 0 0.4 is 0 0.28. 0 0.0025 times a half is a very small number, 0 0.0025. 
times v squared. I'm going to divide then, right, both sides by 0 0.00125. So I want to get uh, 0 0.28 divided by 0 0.0025. That's 112 equals v squared. I square both sides to get to cancel my squared sign, and I'm going to get square root of 112 is about 10.6, which means our best answer is round 10.6 rounds up to 11. Turn it up to 11, 11 meters a second is going to be my, yeah, wait, that's not right, it should be 15. Oh, okay, oh, we made a mistake, what we did wrong, let's go back and check. Um, the answer should be C. All right, so this is a good, so I like when this happens. I made a mistake somewhere, where's my mistake? Let's find it, I hope it's not the math. Uh, let's see, 0 0.0025, let's make sure I got these units right here. All right, so 40 divided by 100, yeah, that's right. Two and a half divided by a thousand. Uh, that number divided by two. Point two eight divided by that. Ah, yep, I messed up. I don't know what I did. Somewhere along the road, I messed up. This one twelve is wrong. So let's go back. So, point two eight divided by point oh oh one two five. Two eight divided by point oh oh two one two five. I punched in my calculator wrong. It's 224. 224 equals v squared. So I just I just I punched in my calculator wrong. My bad. Square root of that. Square root of that. V is equal to square root of 20 to 24, which is 14.96, which is very close to 15. And there we go. That's our right answer. C. All right. Sorry about sorry about that. Hope that makes sense. Cool. Let's keep going. We're almost there. Number 20. Let's get rid of this. So. Then Distract us. Racy, 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 racy. A box of mass m is initially at le uh, at rest at the top of a ramp that is at an angle theta with the horizontal. The block is at a height h and length l from the bottom of the ramp. The block is released and slides down the ramp. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the ramp is mu. What is the kinetic energy of the box at the bottom of the ramp? All right. Well, again, um, this time. We're going to, the, our initial energy, let me start it this way. Our initial energy, plus or minus any work being done, must equal our final energy, right? Now, if there was no friction, it, the answer would simply be A. Because whatever energy we have in the beginning, which is gravitational potential, must equal the kinetic energy at the end. So all the gravitational potential in GH becomes kinetic energy, right? But there is work being done in this case. The work is being done by friction. So what is the friction force? Let's draw a free body diagram. This, block, this dot represents my box. I have gravity down, mg, and I have normal force this way. And I'm going to have friction up the ramp, right? Because I'm going to be sliding down the ramp. So my components of gravity are down the ramp and into the ramp. I don't really need components of gravity here, but whatever. All right, now my uh, friction force must be equal, am I going at a constant speed? Doesn't say. All right. Um, block is at least in slides down the ramp. All right, doesn't say. All right, so who cares? All right, so we're going to find this friction force here, right? All right? So what is friction force? Friction force, force of friction, equals mu times n, right? Well, what is n? Isn't, doesn't n have to equal, let's get a different color, let's go, Bluey. Doesn't uh, this component in have to equal this component going into the ramp, right? They got to cancel. Remember, the block isn't going to float off the ramp. It's not going to be crushed into the ramp. So those two components must equal one another. So what is this component of gravity? Well, it, if my angle for theta, sorry, I'm getting my pin right here, is here. This is theta then this is cosine, isn't it? It's adjacent. So mg, the normal normal force, n, let's go down here, n equals mg cosine of theta, that's my normal force. So that means the friction force, this is an, <laughs> my handwriting is so bad, I'm sorry guys. This is n, the normal force, equals that. So that means the friction force must equal mg mu cosine of theta, right? I'm just picking, I'm just shoving, pl plugging that mu in and n and mg cosine theta all multiplied together. It doesn't matter what order they're in, right? 
Now that's that is friction force, um, and the distance. So the work now work is the force times displacement. Well, I know the displacement is this length L, right? So my, the work done by friction is going to be m g mu cosine theta times L, since L is the displacement down the ramp, right? So let's put it all together now. So my initial energy is mgh minus the work done by friction, which is mg mu cosine theta L. And that's going to equal my final energy, which is kinetic, right? At the end, I'm not going to have any gravitational potential energy. I'm only going to have kinetic energy because I lost all my, all my height. So this is my k at the end, right? So my kinetic energy equals this. So find the one that makes, matches up the best. That's like it's going to be uh, C, which is the right answer, mgh minus mu mgl. So they put the mu in the front and the l. It doesn't matter what order. They're all being multiplied together, right? So it doesn't matter what order you put them in. mg mu cosine theta l is the same thing as mu mgl cosine theta. It's all the same difference, right? Okay, that's number 20. Very good. Almost there. Hang on, guys. All right. Number 21. I'm having fun. I don't know about you. I'm having a great time. Okay, okay. 50 kilogram athlete running at speed V grabs a light rope that hangs from a 10 meter high platform and swings to a maximum of 1.8 meters above the ground. Later, a 100 kilogram athlete running at the same speed grabs a similar rope hanging only five meters from, the, uh, from a five, blah, 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 sorry, grabs a similar rope hanging from a five meter high platform. What is the maximum height to which the 100 kilogram athlete swings? All right, well, this is pretty much a energy conversion problem, right? We have this time though we're going from kinetic to gravitational potential instead of the other way around, so we usually do. So whatever kinetic energy we have initially is going to equal our gravitational potential at the end, right? Imagine a guy on a rope, right? He runs or, or a woman, they, they run, they grab the rope, they swing up, up, they go up, 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 and then eventually they're going to stop, right? At their maximum height, they stop and they fall back down, right? But at that moment when they're at their maximum height, they don't have any velocity, right? So at maximum height, I'm, all, I'm only going to have gravitational potential. That's my, at my final height. So let's do the, um, let's see. What is the maximum height at which 100 kilogram athlete swings? All right, so you can do the math here. There's a shortcut, of course, right? The shortcut is that it's the same height. It's the same. The answer is B. But I'll do the math to show you anyway, right? Because the math doesn't matter. All right, so our mg delta y must equal an initial, right? Our, oh, sorry, I'm doing it backwards. I'm so used to doing potential to kinetic. All right, so our initial kinetic energy, one half mv squared, must equal our final gravitational potential energy when we have no, uh, you know, at, at our maximum height there on our swing, on our Tarzan swing, mg delta y. The m's cancel, m on both sides, they cancel out. So I get one half v squared over g equals my delta y. Well, <clears throat> my, it said same speed uh, as the other guy. Did it actually give us a speed? Oh, they didn't give us a speed. So this is v, right? Oh, so this is, we can't really do the math. But hopefully you see now that the mass doesn't matter. So if the velocity is the same, g is the same, nothing else matters, guys. Um, they're going to swing to the same height. Um, so I guess we, I guess we could find the speed since we know how high he went. But I'm, and I'm not going to bother because you know y'all are probably pretty worn out by this point. We're in our 21, so uh, take my word for it. <laughs> you know what? Fine. You can always just skip ahead in the video anyway. I'll, I'll do it. Gosh, fine. I'll do it. All right. So the first athlete who has 50 kilograms. Uh, his maximum height is 1.8 meters of the ground. So his maximum gravitational potential for the first athlete is his mass, 50, times 10 g times 1.8 meters above the ground. So this is going to be his, so this must equal, that energy must equal his initial kinetic energy, right? So we're going to solve for his velocity here. So we'll do 50 times 10 times 1.8. 900. So we have 900 joules of kinetic energy. So what must have been his, his speed? Well, we have 900 equals 1 half m, which is 50, times v squared. So I'm going to solve for v. So half of 50 is 25. 900 divided by 25 is 36. Because v squared, square root of 36 is 6. So our velocity must have been 6. So if we do the same velocity here for our second heavier athlete, 1 half times 6 squared over g, which is 10, 
I bet you $100 is going to be 1.8. 6 squared is 36 times a half. That's 18 divided by 10. Oh my god, I got 1.8. Right? Science works. All right, awesome. So the mass doesn't matter, same height. Okay, let's go to 22. And a so similar problem. Hmm. An athlete with mass M running at speed V grabs a light rope that hangs from a ceiling of height H and swings to a maximum height of H1. In another room with a lower ceiling of height H divided by 2, a second athlete with mass 2M, so again, twice the mass, it's very similar to the previous problem if you haven't noticed, running at the same speed V grabs a light rope hanging from the ceiling and swings to a maximum height of H2. Does the maximum height reached by the two athletes, sorry, how does the maximum height reach for the two athletes, compare and why? Well, as we just saw from before, it's the same height. It doesn't make any difference what the masses are. What matters is how fast they're running. The answer is D. The two athletes reach the same height because the athletes run with the same speed. All right, that's all that matters. Okay, going to 23 now. We're almost there, guys. All right, so our last two problems, they are multi-answer. Let's select two correct answers. Number 23, this basically was your power lab, like almost exactly. Uh, a student wants to approximate the amount of work uh, at the for, at the force due to gravity does on the student as the student walks up a set of stairs. Which of the following measurements must the student collect in order to approximate the amount of work done by Earth on the student? Select two answers. So this is exactly what we did in our power lab. Remember, we walked up the stairs, we timed it. We measured the height, we went up the stairs, and later we also took our stopwatch to find the power, because power is changing energy over time. This is just asking us, how do we find the work being done? Well, the work is changing energy. We're gaining gravitational potential energy up as we go up the stairs, we're gaining height. So we gotta measure the height, um, and we gotta find the uh, um, how the mass of the student is. Remember, we weighed ourselves on, on the uh, force plates before we did the power lab also. We got to find basically uh, gravitational potential here, which is m g delta y. So we got to find the mass of the student to get our, to get m, and we got to get uh, the vertical height above the above the ground to find delta y. G of course is 10, and there you go, a and d. Um, the total incline length of the stairs doesn't make a difference. That we, we remember only vertical height matters, not not the diagonal diagonal length. B said the angle between the inclined portion of the stairs and horizontal, we don't care about that. Again, only matters is how high up we go. 24, all right, last one. An inclined track is secured to a table. The height of the highest point of the track over the tabletop is H1. The height from the tabletop to the floor is H2. A block of mass M is released from rest and slides down the track such that all frictional forces are considered to be negligible. All right, no friction. The block leaves a track horizontally and strikes the ground at a distance d from the edge of the track as shown. Which of the following statements is correct about the scenario? Select two answers. All right, um, let's, the, let's get the right ones out of the way. So the answer is C and D. Let's look at C first. The total mechanical energy of the system containing only the block increases from the moment of release to the moment it strikes the ground. Only the block. Guys, we said this 100 times in class. If we're only considering the block as a system, can we even think about or even, you know, can we measure anything? Gravitational potential energy. The answer is no, because we have no reference point, right? It's just the block. So the kinetic energy, I'm sorry, the mechanical energy of just the block system is only its velocity, because we can't, we can't even measure gravitational potential energy because we the earth isn't in the system so isn't it going to gain speed as you go down this slide and then off the ramp it's going to it's falling right essentially so it's going to gain speed because even though gravity isn't in the system it's still pulling it down right it's still going to speed it up it's just outside the system um so it is going to gain mechanical energy it's going to gain speed and therefore gain kinetic energy and therefore gain kinetic uh, mechanical energy and d is also correct the total mechanical energy of the block Earth system remains constant because there's no friction. As we lose height, we're, we're going downhill. So we're gaining kinetic energy as, we, as we're you know, accelerating towards the ground. We're also losing height, which means we're losing gravitational potential. So whatever we lose as potential energy, we're going to gain as kinetic. And since the Earth is now in our system, we can consider the gravitational potential energy. And so again, as I said, whatever we lose as potential, we're going to gain as kinetic. So it's kind of a, it's a wash. It's an equal trade-off. No change in mechanical energy for that system. A and B are both incorrect 
B says if the block's mass is increased to 2m, the block will land a distance 2d away from the edge of, this, of the track. That's wrong. It actually will be a little bit further than that. You can do the math yourself, figure it out. I'm not going to code it. We're probably we're all tired. We want to wrap this up, um, but it'll be it won't be 2d. If the block is released from a height, um, uh, if the block is released from a height to h1, so twice as high, the block will land a distance 2d away from the edge of the track. Basically, the same thing is. It's a very similar question as uh, B. It's it's just not you know do the math. I don't really don't feel like it. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap this up. So, um, but maybe you know if one of y'all can do it and show me and prove to me that it's not 2D, that's cool. Um, but uh, basically the the thing is that the velocity we're gaining is not gonna be double the velocity, so we're not gonna have double the distance. Uh, but anyway, um, all right, there we go, guys. That's the whole test. Hope you um, were able to correct all your mistakes and everything made sense. And it didn't make sense because I might have gone a little fast in some places. You can always you know, rewatch it. Ask me in class. Shoot me an email. Message me on your mind. Ask me after school. Come to tutoring. Any of those things. I'm here for you. You're in my life. I don't have much of a life. So hope you had a hope you learned something. Have a great weekend. Bye.